Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Teresa Bailey. I am a wealth strategist with Waddell and Associates. And thank you for tuning in to another edition of our weekly strategic insight live. This week will feature a Q&A session with David Waddell. And um, we were able this week to collect many of your questions. And uh, David, of course, put together a slide deck to cover all of those questions. Before I turn it over to David, let me uh, review a few housekeeping items with each of you. You'll notice a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. There you're able to submit your questions. Hopefully we'll have time to get to some of those at the very end. Also, if you would like to text the word Waddell, W-A-D-D-E-L-L, to 44222, just like you're entering a phone number into a new text box on your cell phone, that will opt you in to receive more information and updates from us ongoing. And with that, I am going to uh, toss the screen over to David. Thank you, Teresa, and good morning, everybody. Um, I have a, uh, a something to admit to you. Last week when we did our presentation on the coronavirus and what we thought was happening in the markets, I felt like it was just a one-sided conversation. Normally in those formats, when we're all together, I'm able to take questions. And so it felt like I had half performed for the audience. So we were able to harvest some questions from you all this week. Thank you for that. I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions, but I tried to weave them together into groups so that I could address at least the broader topics. So good Friday morning to you. Um, it is springtime and the flowers are blooming, the birds are chirping. So even though we are besieged uh, and isolated, the world is uh, alive outside. If you get the opportunity, please go out and enjoy it. With that, I'm going to dig right into the details, and I'll pick up where we left off last week. Yep, there's the disclaimer. Please tell T you read it. All right, last week I ended with the bottom line, and so I'm going to begin this week with the bottom line. We compared, if you recall, where we are today with an experience we had as a nation and a world really in 1957 and 1958 when we experienced the Spanish flu, or the Asian flu, excuse me. Just to take you back through those numbers for orientation, it was a deadly global pandemic. There were a million souls that um, faded away, sadly, uh, which was 0.03% of the global population. We did have a bear market. We also had a recession that was sharp. When the fatality rates reached their peak, the GDP drawdown rate reached its nadir. That was in Q1 of 1958. Um, cases peaked in, or fatalities peaked in Q4 of 1957. And also the market bottomed at that time. So market bottomed, then we had a big recession. This is the analog for where we are today. In terms of the coronavirus, you know, we have twice the global population today. If you use the same ratios, then that could claim 2 million lives. We have had a bear market. Um, obviously, it's been very volatile, but at the bottom, we got down beneath this, I think, beneath 34%. And we are going to have a hard stop recession. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But just assuming it's 1957 all over again, we'll see a 10% GDP drawdown pretty sharp, likely larger than that. We'll get to that. So does that mean that we'll have a market bottom in advance of that recession? Perhaps. There are three things that we need as a population to be inoculated from. One is the financial crisis. I can't say enough good things about what the Fed has done to provide liquidity and backstop fixed income markets, um, ensure that the plumbing's not clogged in the interbank market. They've done an excellent job. We are not gonna have a financial crisis. It's not gonna be easy, but we're not gonna have a financial crisis. In terms of the economic crisis, I mean, I can't even keep up with where this legislation stands at this point, but there is a $2 trillion package weaving its way through Congress. And I think it's, there's a vote scheduled at noon today, maybe in the House of Representatives. I don't know, it's been, pretty nauseating to watch, but it is a huge package. And once that comes to market, that will help inoculate us from the economic crisis. 
And in terms of the health crisis, we're not there yet, but the scientists are all at work on it. We're all in isolation. So we are addressing the issue and I feel confident we will resolve it. So there's a lot of questions about V-shaped returns, U-shaped returns, L-shaped returns. I even heard a W. Somebody the other day threw a Y at me. Um, and so, you know, creative pundits will figure out a way to use the entire alphabet. But going back into history, if we look at 1957, we did, like I said, have a bear market. We had a recession and we had a global pandemic. That's what makes it such a good analog. So for the year in 1957, large stocks were down 11, small stocks, harder hit, less liquid, more economically sensitive, were down 15%. And then there was a rapid recovery in 1958, which people don't talk enough about. Large stocks up 44%, small stocks up 65%. And so this is where we left off last week. I said, look, here's where we are year to date, 27% on the Dow uh, on Thursday's close, I think, of last week. And then the small caps were down 41%, particularly hard hit in lockstep with what happened back in 1957. And so we opined at the end of the presentation that in 2021, you know, we could see a rapid rebound. It may get worse, I said, but it will certainly get better. Well, what a difference a week makes. So the rapid rebound, at least for now, came this week. Um, and since the low from earlier in the week, really, we were up 24% on large stocks, 22% on small stocks. It does irritate me a little bit that small stocks didn't outperform. Um, I think where we are in the cycle right now is that we've gone through sort of the liquidity panic and now things are transitioning more into a fundamental sort of appraisal. Um, and those who have cash are obviously using it and shopping. And we're seeing some of that buying activity, but you've still got some rapid traders in there, some shorts, et cetera. So I'm not sounding the all clear, but it is encouraging that not only can markets go down, but they can also go up. All right. So let's take the first biggest and most obvious question. I'm actually quite proud of all of you who are clients of Waddell and Associates. I haven't gotten this nearly as much. And I think that's because you've been battle trained a little bit by what happened in 2008. But I thought about this a lot and thought I was thinking about this a lot in 2009. And so let's see what I had to say about it then. This is actually my response to that question from my State of the Union address, which, by the way, was 275 slides in 2009. So those of you that were in the audience, you may remember it was two hours, and I'm sorry, um, so young. Um, but anyway, so why didn't I go to cash in 2009? Well, number one, and this is important, our financial planning simulations took into account the depression area returns when calculating probability. Remember, we live in probability world, not possibility world. If the asset allocation is correct, then these sort of events have already been pre-planned for. This was interesting. We, in the investment committee at the end of 2007, expected a difficult year. And we went back and looked at our managers and uh, appraised how they did uh, or analyzed how they did in 2000 to 2002's bear market and ensured that we had people that had shown the ability to play defense. Furthermore, we also introduced into the portfolio a hedged position and reduced some risks in our special situations component um, taking down our China position, which made a ton of money for us back in 2007. So we tried to prepare uh, for a down market in 2008. Why didn't you go to cash? Well, panic's historically a bad time to sell. Once you're in the fight, you know, you need to be in the fight. Uh, it's hard to hide. Um, and high level of volatility makes exits treacherous. Remember, there were some huge up days back in 2008. We had a 12% up day in October, followed by another one a little while later of 11%. And even those who called the 2008 bear market suffered unless they were in 100% cash. And we went and evaluated some you know, famous managers who were great at playing defense and they got annihilated too. So my net bottom line on 2009 was it was a 100 year event. We did what we could. Well, let's bring that up to today. So why didn't you hedge this time? Well, again, if you have proper financial planning, you've got proper asset allocation, and that does contemplate drawdowns like this. So that's the value of working with an advisor, um, which is why maybe we're getting a bunch of calls. The do-it-yourselfers are having a challenging time at this point. And, you know, 
long bull markets create a lot of that, but I will still advocate for our um, guild and tell you a financial advisor helps a lot to prepare for situations like this. Um, now, I learned a lot in 2009 and our whole investment committee did. What I learned was we can't trust the active managers to play defense. We need to take over that responsibility ourselves. Number two, um, even though we hedged in 2009, we did it kind of cute. We used a manager who had a good defensive track record and he owned some gold stocks and some things that were inversely correlated, but in a liquidity panic, in a sell everything moment, those sort of cute hedges didn't work. And so what we did was we redesigned the portfolio to include beta hedges, just market hedges in general, and in fact had put some of those in place back in 2019 to prepare for what we thought could be a recession. Um, and that carried us into 2020 with some defense in the portfolio, which was you know, really lucky in some cases. Um, volatility is still, symmetric, right? So he, even this week, and I pulled these numbers from this week, uh, on the 24th, just a couple of days ago, the market was up 11.4%, the most since 1933, I think. And then obviously yesterday, we had a 6.5% uh, increase in return. So the volatility goes both ways. It goes down, it goes up. And in terms of calling this one, nobody called a pandemic. I mean, there were some who were in the recession camp as we were last year due to tight Fed policy and also the trade war. But with the Fed coming to the rescue and the trade skirmish sort of dying down, we were getting a little bit more bullish on the economy as was everybody. Um, so nobody saw the pandemic coming. And uh, unfortunately, 2020 is yet another 100 year event. Um, so we had a financial crisis, obviously in 08, we're having a health crisis in 2020, but that answers why we didn't go to cash. Here's some other things I found interesting from a philosophical standpoint that we touted not doing in 2007. Um, we didn't take counterparty risk in 2008. You know, we don't custody client assets with investment banks. We custody them with straight brokerage firms, Charles Schwab, et cetera, and we were doing the same then, so we own or our client assets were held at Charles Schwab rather than Lehman Brothers, Merrill, Bear Stearns, places that had problems. So we had good uh, service providers and counterparties. In terms of the portfolios, we didn't amplify the risk levels in the portfolio. Leverage cuts deep when it moves against you. Also, that was a time of Madoff and Alan Stanford and a whole bunch of fraudsters. Um, we do not go into black box um, you know, investment schemes to try and generate excess returns or dupe our uh, investors. Remember, we invest our money in the same things you do, and I ain't going in there. In terms of lockups, we don't go into things that are illiquid. Uh, if you can't get your cash back, then it's really not yours, it's somebody else's. And so in moments where you want flexibility, um, you don't want, you know, long-term lockups where you can't get access to capital. So we don't do that, and no unregulated assets. Um, First and foremost, our job is to protect you from the catastrophic investment risks. We're willing to take market risk over time, but succumbing to some of these temptations can be asymmetric risk and, and fatal in some cases. Um, here's the other reason why you don't go to cash. You would think that the investment return spectrum is a bell curve. It is not. This is what the distribution looks like for investment returns. So 6% of the time, the stock market returns 20%, um, negative 20% or less. 37% of the time, the stock market returns 20% or more. So here's 2008. It was the terrible year we were down 37%, right? Well, here's 2009, we were up 26%. Here's 2010, we were up 15%. Here's 2011, up 2%. 2012, up 16%. And then finally, 2013, up 32%. So odds are in your favor that the stock market will appreciate more than 20% if you look at the actual distribution of return. So we have these somewhat near-death experiences periodically, um, but the weight of the evidence uh, certainly leads one to want to be long markets over a long period of time. And that's how they continue to fight back from these events so successfully.
All right, so here's another question. Um, Larry, if you're out there, this was yours. This was a really good question. Does WNA have any current counterparty risk today? Are the underlying investment companies at risk? That's a really good point. Remember, we do use intermediaries to get to the markets, whether ETFs, mutual funds. Um, occasionally, we'll take direct positions. Um, so your ownership is actually in the underlying securities, but there is an intermediary. There is a counterparty. So we continue to custody assets with Charles Schwab, and we've added in since 2009 a healthy allocation to Fidelity. These are not investment banks. Okay? These are just straight brokerage custodial businesses. Um, so they don't have levered up balance sheets. We don't get into the zone that took down a Lehman, a Bear, a Merrill, um, those sort of entities back in 2008. So we want very stable custodians to warehouse our client assets. And that's what we've got with Schwab and Fidelity are clearly industry leaders. In terms of the investments that are within our model portfolio, um, I had Tim pull a list of our providers to give you some feel for their scale. Um, we are sensitive to scale when we're making client allocations. Again, I don't want to take bets, asymmetric risks, small shops that do something weird um, occasionally. And I like a small shop, um, but you do have going concern considerations when you're allocating client funds. So. We use Vanguard, we use Fidelity, we use iShares, JP Morgan, BlackRock. I mean, it's, it's all the names you know. Um, we do have one ETN, I won't get too technical there, but that's issued by Barclays, which is an A1 credit per Moody's. Um, and then we have one small position with advisor shares at the bottom. Uh, that's actually our short position. They have a billion in assets under management. They could go away, but the, so will the short. Um, it's temporary. So you can see it's a, it's a long list of names you know, places I feel comfortable warehousing client assets. And again, you own the underlying securities. So if something happened to double line, we'd still have the underlying securities. Good question. All right, what do I do with cash? We've been getting this a lot lately um, and I have some thoughts on it. First of all, if you are concerned um, and I'm not raising some sort of red flag here. Some people really like the idea of having their cash deposits covered by the FDIC. Um, that's a very healthy strategy, uh, especially when there's not much uh, interest to be earned. Um, so might as well upgrade your security profile. But if you got cash in a bank, the FDIC will insure it up to $250,000 per depositor per bank. Um, so if you wanna pursue, um, you know, FDIC insurance, and you don't want to do it through a product I'll talk about in a second, then you got to have multiple banks if you've got, call it a million dollars you want to spread around. Um, there's no rate of return necessarily in there um, in the overnight market for deposits, but you do get that added security. In the taxable money market fund um, arena, which, you know, there was some concern if you go back to 2008, the money market funds, I forgot which one it was, started with a P broke the buck and people got very nervous about money market funds. The Fed has stepped in to ensure that that will not occur um, this go round, but taxable money market funds are paying 85 basis points. I believe these numbers change daily. This was from yesterday uh, and they do not carry those guarantees. So you do have a trade off there, security for yield, but the Fed has backstop uh, the money market. So not too worried about it, but if you are, there are some other ways to get protection. Three month CDs right now are paying 25 basis points. You lock up your money for three months, you've got some sort of penalty there, but if they're under 250 and they're at a bank, you do qualify for that FDIC insurance. Uh, three month T-bill is obviously backed by the full faith and credit of your US government. And right now it pays zero. So all you're doing there is just trying to get some security for your cash because you're not getting any return. Um, within the custodians, there are money market funds that are backed um, exclusively by treasuries. And so those are backed by the full faith and credit of the government and take larger balances. And as of yesterday, we're paying 24 basis points because they take some duration risk. And then lastly, through our affiliation with Focus Financial Partners, which has been great, we've got the opportunity to access a cash solution 
that can provide FDIC insurance up to three and a half to five million dollars, depending on the day. And that's currently yielding 25 basis points. So if you've got a bunch of cash and you really want to keep it liquid, maybe it's an emergency fund or you just want to have a feather bed of cash, there are some options for you there. Just call us and we'll help you position. If you don't need a feather bed of cash, here's something to consider. Uh, this chart's a few days old, so these numbers have actually gotten better. But of the dividend paying companies in the S&P 500, 93% of them have yields greater than the 10 year US Treasury. So there is yield in the stock market. And right now the yield in the stock market is actually better than the yield in the bond market, um, unless you go play in the high yield space, which is pretty treacherous right now. So if you're looking for high quality yield, you can buy high quality stocks and not only get better yields than you would get in, in you know, these cash solutions, but also get the opportunity for these positions to grow earnings and share values over time. So stocks are much more attractive than bonds and much more attractive than cash. All right, um, someone said the economy could shrink 30%, David. Is that possible? Yes, it is. This is uh, a list of street estimates. Um, I got this from Liz Ann Saunders at Charles Schwab a couple of days ago. Did a great job of compiling them. And you can see the most bullish on the economy thinks that we only go down 3.3% in the second quarter. The most bearish, Morgan Stanley does believe, yes, we could go down 30%. Now remember, there's a trick to the math here. It is quarter over quarter times four. So that's how they're, it's annualized. It's not year over year. These numbers get a whole lot nicer if you do year over year. Nonetheless, a 30% drawdown is possible and it's terrifying. Here's what they're not telling you. This is Morgan Stanley's estimate that came out with that 30.1% drawdown in Q2. Look at Q3. They expect the economy will grow 30% quarter over quarter in year three. And then look at the subsequent quarters. 3, 3, 4, 0, 3, 3, 2, 9, 2, 9. This compares with the 2.3 that we've been growing at since the beginning of this economic recovery. So yes, it is absolutely possible that the economy and, and you know, almost probable will go down 20, 30% quarter over quarter in Q2. But just as probable as that is, is that there will be a sharp recovery. Um, I mean, my hair is getting long, right? I mean, as soon as they let me out, I'm going to the salon. Right. And there are several things I, I, I had pop tarts for breakfast. Right. So, I mean, there's things I want to do, stuff I want to buy, feeling a little cooped up, may take a vacation. As soon as this thing clears, the spending will kick back in. Trust me, that's what this chart contemplates. So, yes, great question. It's possible we could have a 30 percent drawdown in Q2, but it's also possible that we have a 30 percent draw up in Q3. What will the stimulus do to the national debt? This is a really powerful question. I have struggled with this for quite a while. Um, so I'll give you the answer. Um, first of all, the stimulus that they are voting on, hopefully today, if not right now, is roughly 2X the stimulus that we had in 2008. So our cash for clunkers stimulus was about 800 billion. And this one, which is, I guess you can't call airplanes clunkers, but nonetheless, is a true $2 trillion stimulus package. So in 2008, that $800 billion amounted to 5.5% of US GDP. In 2020, the $2 trillion amounts to 9.3% of GDP. This is a massive stimulus package. Now, for those of you paying attention, you know that we don't exactly run a surplus in the government. So we're printing and spending this money and issuing this debt um, and we don't really have it, so we have to borrow it. Well, here is a chart to show you how much fiscal capacity we really have and what the de deficits have looked like during major events in the past. Now, pardon me for having two lines here. The blue line is the deficit. The orange line is the primary deficit, which means no interest payments. So Trump has been running primary deficits of, you know, two and a half, three percent, and then you throw the interest payments on it and they get down to five, right? 
So the accumulated deficits require lots of interest payments. Um, so we were running a 5% deficit going into this moment. In the Great Recession to battle that, we stimulated, uh, like I showed you, 5.5%. That put us into a deficit of 10%. You go back to World War II, we ran a deficit of 30%. World War I, we were down near 15, 16, 17% as an emergency deficit. In the Civil War, we were down at 10%. Um, I, I have to go back and brush up on the War of 1812. Point is, we have had moments like this in the past that we have declared national emergencies, national crises. We have issued a lot of debt and done it quickly to stimulate the economy or fund the war effort, and yet it hasn't broken the bank. So how big is the bank? That's a really good question. There's only one way in my head to answer that question, and it goes back to where is your Grecian moment, right? When do you have so much debt on your balance sheet that people refuse to lend? And how do you know that people refuse to lend? Because your interest rates overnight go from being 2% to 20%. That's happen in Greece, okay? So this is a chart, it's a couple years old. It's hard to get this data. Um, anybody knows where to get this on, in, in you know, quick time, let me know. But this is total debt to GDP for the G7 countries and China. And this goes back to 2018. So you can take these numbers a little bit higher. So Japan has a total debt to GDP ratio of call it 400%. France, 300, Canada, 300, the UK, 280, Italy, 256, China, that's up at like 280 now, I think. And the United States, we're at like 260, 275 now. And then Germany, 175%. So this is total debt, meaning consumers, corporations, governments, non-financial, because that gets wonky, um, as a percentage of total GDP. All right, now let's take a look at their interest rates and see who's close to their Grecian moment. Japan has a debt of 400% to GDP, and yet their interest rate on their 10-year bond is 0.01%. That's not close to a Grecian moment. France, their interest rate's negative. Canada, very close to ours. Uh, the US and Canada harmonize around 85 basis points. The UK, uh, 40 basis points. Italy, mm, a little bit more concerned about the Italian bonds, but at 118 basis points, certainly not Grecian levels of concern. China, that debt market is hard to get to anyway, but their dim sum bonds, as they call them, are at 2.7%. United States, we're at 84 basis points, and Germany has negative interest rates. So as a thought experiment, we are the United States of America. We have the US dollar. The US dollar is the world's reserve currency. When things get weird, everybody wants the dollar. In fact, the dollar is up 7% year to date because the world goes into the safety and security of the US dollar. And the world also believes that because of our democratic system, if something goes wrong in the United States, we can quickly change our mind, we can have a vote, things can change. And so where is our Grecian moment? It ain't 250% of GDP. We're getting ready to add 10% more. It ain't 260. If Japan is still getting money for free at 400% debt to GDP, Maybe ours is 500, maybe it's 600, who knows, right? But it's nowhere close to here. So we've got a lot of debt capacity. Now, morally, I'm not necessarily for all of that because I think you should keep tighter and more current accounts. However, the marketplace is willing to subsidize this largesse a, a, a long, long way from where we are today. So there's plenty of debt capacity. What will all this money printing do to inflation? Great question. So here's what's been going on lately. The Fed has been printing money faster than ever before. Um, this is their total assets on their balance sheets and it's just a you know, collection of, they've bought, printed money and bought things, collection of securities, so treasury bonds, you know, they're in the muni market now, all sorts of agency paper, overnight stuff, repos, whatever. They're just, they're, they're soaking up a lot of securities and they're pumping out a lot of fresh money. So we've gone to record levels within the last week, really, um, on the money printing quantitative easing side. 
and total assets on the Fed balance sheet. And at the same time, here is the 10 year break even inflation rate. Um, and I pulled this as of last night through Wednesday. It's come back a little bit, but you can see the market's not afraid of inflation. It's worried about deflation because of that 30% down quarter that Morgan Stanley's predicting in the second quarter. So the inflation may be there and it may be there further down the road, but those fears are not here today. In fact, the market's telling you it's looking 10 years forward and it thinks inflation is going to be 0.8%. So right now we don't have any issues. The Fed, you can print away. I didn't have this slide in there. The Fed has 5 trillion on its balance sheet. Um, the Bank of Japan has 5 trillion on the balance sheet. It has a much smaller economy, okay? So as a percentage of GDP, the Fed's at 25% or something, percentage of GDP, the, the Japanese are like 50% or above. None of that's generated inflation. So there isn't, an example on the planet that I found yet where quantitative easing by the Fed has translated into inflation. Now you can go back to the Weimar regimes and things like that, but in big liquid systems, I haven't found really a positive and direct correlation between QE and inflation. Um, so QE should not drive inflation. Should I sell my international and emerging markets holdings? Good question. And this comes up a lot because you may remember that we are global investors. I like the idea of being diversified across countries, regimes, currencies, interest rates. Um, the more diversification we can get, the better. Markets tend to oscillate over time. Sometimes tech does great. Sometimes financials do great. Sometimes France does great. Sometimes the United States does great. So why not own them all? But right now, with this flight to quality, there's certainly some squawking about whether you should own anything outside of, well, your living room, Tennessee or the United States of America. When you talk about global investing, the most important variable is the US dollar and its value in comparison to other currencies around the world. So this chart is called the Big Mac Index, and this is something that The Economist magazine came up with years ago and said, okay, what's the price of a Big Mac, which is the same sandwich in all these different countries, and the difference in value is just a currency, you know, overvalued, undervalued um, assessment. And right now, based upon the Big Mac index, when you look at currencies relative to the US dollar, the only two that are overvalued, according to where you buy your Big Macs, are the Swiss franc and the Norwegian krone. The euro, the pound, the yen, the peso, the yuan, and the lira, Turkish lira, I don't know why I picked that one, but anyway, are all dramatically undervalued relative to the US dollar. So if the US dollar is in decline, that could be good for international assets. US dollar cycles are rather elongated. Here's a chart that breaks down the three major dollar cycles we have seen since we came off the gold standard in 1971. And you can see that they tend to be somewhere around 14, 15, 16, 17 years. So the dollar peaked back in 2002, started to decline and has advanced precipitously since 2010. Um, but then started to weaken a little bit. And there are some fundamental drivers for that, I think. One is that rising deficits have been bearish for the US dollar. So people talk about twin deficits, and we'll do some terminology. Twin deficits means you've got a trade deficit and you've got a fiscal deficit. The US is getting ready to run massive, massive fiscal deficits. And by the way, the size of our stimulus package dwarfs every other stimulus package on the planet. China's stimulus package as a percentage of GDP wasn't nearly as big. Europe's getting in the game, but they don't like to do big stimulus like we do. Um, and so we're the ones that are pumping the most into saving the system. Um, and we're doing that not only with the Fed, but more so with fiscal stimulus, and that is leading to record deficits. That's not good for the US dollar. Um, additionally, we run a trade deficit, as you know, which is what sparked the conflagration with 
China. So we're going to continue to run um, twin deficits. And if you track the movement of the trade weighted dollar relative to those twin deficits, they are correlated. Bigger deficits, lower dollar. Monetary policy can also be dollar bearish, right? So what the Fed was trying to do before they went into emergency mode was trying to rebuild bank reserves, right? Pump more money in the system, they accumulate within the banking system, that makes the banking system more liquid and that's better for markets, okay? Just to simplify things. So they were already in a process of trying to reliquify the banking system. That's why they started up QE in October really of last year. Um, now that QE has gone through the roof to try and do everything they can to liquefy. And so there is some correlation between central bank activity and the value of your currency. And so more excess reserves as they build could be dollar bearish. At least there's been a correlation lagged 60 days in the past. So what does that mean? Really, we saw the dollar peak in 2016. We've seen a spike here as there's been a global panic that everybody rushes back into the dollar. Part of the reason why the market performed so strongly this week was that the dollar actually came down from its most recent high. Um, down dollar is good for the global system overall. Um, and so we saw the dollar peak in 2016 and it may have started that longer term downtrend. So we may be in a regime change for the US dollar once we get past this panic. All right, I'm going to spend a, just a little bit on valuations. Valuations don't really matter when all you want to own is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, and you just don't own anything else because that's where the momentum is. But when the momentum breaks and you got to go shopping, the fundamentals matter again. And so let's take a look at the U.S. has dramatically outperformed as we've gone through the strong dollar cycle since 2010. The regime could be changing. So let's figure out point in time where we are and where the relative values are. All right, so the US market, and I pulled this through yesterday. And I'm sorry, my charts aren't prettier. You know, normally we take them and we make them, you know, WNA like from an aesthetic. And so this is, this is the raw stuff, but this is the world we're living in right now. All right, so the US forward PE, which what is E gonna be in the future? Lots of debate about that, but just point in time for comparative purposes, US forward PE is 14 times, all right? We have been below 14 times if we go back to 2001 for a pretty extended period. So 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, basically five years, the U.S. stock market spent time beneath 14.1 in terms of a forward PE. The rest of the world, the world outside the U.S., this includes the developed markets, this includes the emerging markets, every other country but the U.S. is currently trading at 11 times earnings as a basket. And if you go back and do that same analysis, the rest of the world's been below 11 times some, a little bit in 2008 during the panic, a little bit in 2011 when we thought the Eurozone was blowing apart, but it hadn't spent nearly as much time beneath this valuation as the U.S. markets have. So that sort of indicates that the international markets are already priced for distress. The U.S. market may need to price a little bit more distress in. This is a fantastic chart. This goes back to really understanding the dollar cycle. Um, 1999 to 2009, the dollar weakened. And it weakened a good deal, right? Coming off that 2002 high that I showed you earlier. Over that period after we went through the bubble in 2000 where the S&P was just wildly overvalued, for 10 years, the S&P cumulatively basically broke even. Over that period, the international markets were up 12% and the emerging markets were up 188%. That's what a weak dollar will do. Well, fast forward to 2010 to 2019, a strong dollar period, the S&P gained 222% during that period, and the international markets were at 60, and the emerging markets were at 45. That's the difference between a strong dollar and a weak dollar. So if you think we may have tipped into a weak dollar regime, and all this government activity sort of supports that theory relative to these other currencies, then it might be time not only to, or, or not to sell the internationals, but to get even longer the internationals. How long will it take for the market to recover? Great question. 
So bear market losses do get recouped, always have. That's that long trend line that we talked about earlier. Not all bear markets are associated with recessions. This is some data going back to 1906 that Ned Davis and Schiller put together, basically saying how long does it take to recoup a bear market? And on average, about three, three and a half years. That includes recessions, non-recessions. You can see there were some extended periods, like obviously 2000 to 2009, that, or seven, I guess, is when we recaptured, seven or eight, early 08, I guess, March of 08. Anyway, um, there are some periods where you've got structural issues, cyclical issues, where things can take longer in the economy, or you've got overvaluation issues. And so there have been some periods, the 30s, the 20s, obviously the 70s was, was just you know awful. We didn't know what to do with our central bank at that time. We had bad policies around price controls and some other things. It was just a terrible decade for the stock market. You can see it took 12 years to recover after the late 60s run. This is some work that Goldman did, I think, um, and it's worth highlighting. They said that there are three types of recessions. One is a structural recession. Go back to 2008, we had a financial crisis. That's because we had a bubble. It was a structural problem. It was a mistake. And we paid dearly for that mistake because it enabled a whole bunch of excess leverage that had to be unwound. Then you've got cyclical recessions. That happens because the Fed tightens interest rates too far. Yield curves invert. Credit dries up. Businesses can't get credit and everything sort of grinds until the yield curve comes back to normal credit becomes available and businesses start up again. So you've got structural recessions, which is, you know, something breaks. You've got cyclical recession where the Fed over tightens, and that happens. And then you've got event driven recessions where you got a 9-11 or you got a coronavirus or some other event that takes a perfectly healthy economy and crushes it. And that's the zone we're in right now. In event driven uh, recoveries, the rebounds can be rather sharp. Think 1987. Um, again, we spent some time on that chart last week, I suppose, looking at drawdowns of 30% or more. Those that were event-driven related, the draw-ups were pretty rapid. So I don't expect this to be a eight-year bear market recovery or a 12-year bear market recovery. I expect it to be more like what um, Goldman thinks in terms of the event-driven uh, recession that we're in today uh, could be a pretty rapid recovery. All right. I mean, politics, right? It's still an election year. Um, this is not my specialty, but I'll opine on it. Again, a disclaimer, because it's just such a volatile subject. Um, I'm not for Trump. I'm not against Trump. I'm just a guy who makes predictions. So here's Trump's approval rating. Guess what, guys? It's rising. Um, nothing like a war to galvanize support for the Oval Office. Um, maybe in juxtaposition what's going on in Congress. Congress's approval rating is always dismal and deserves to be even more dismal, I think, after what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But Trump's approval rating, whatever you think about the guy, is rising. Now, is it high enough to get reelected? I went back and looked at the data on all that stuff. It's not too dissimilar from where Obama's was kind of at this point in the cycle. But I do think he's got one thing in his back pocket, which is probably why he is talking about reopening the economy. Remember this chart? Guess what happens in the third quarter of 2020, election day, November 8th, I think. Um, so if we muscle through after the second quarter to the third quarter and have dramatic economic recovery as the stimulus hits everybody's mailbox and as you know, we see businesses reopen and tourism, you know, start to spool back up. A 30% uh, GDP growth rate certainly could make people feel better. And if he can point to the fact that he pushed through a $2 trillion stimulus, that could be good for him. So I don't know if none of that comes to pass and we're all still sick when it comes to election day, we got to blame somebody, maybe we blame the president. But based upon the current state of play, my guess is the incumbent wins the day. This is a good question too. And I've been thinking a lot about this. There will be structural changes to the economy because of what we're going through now. So somebody asked 18 months from now, will there be any small businesses left? That's a really interesting question. So what can we 
learn from the experience of 2008 that might inform what we can expect going forward in the small business sector. Now, 2008 was a financial crisis. 2020 is a small business crisis. I don't, I don't know that we've ever had one like this, but this is a small business, not a large business crisis. They got big, you know, balance sheets. They'll get 500 billion in stimulus. You know, big businesses will live through this. Small businesses, man, it's tough. And that's the majority of our conversations really um, with our clients right now. So I went back and said, all right, what happened to small banks? Right, we've got a lot of banks in the United States of America. Many of them were in distress. Uh, could we use the experience in small banking to sort of foreshadow the experience in small business in 2020? So this is de novo bank charters, new bank charters. This is startup banks. And on average, going back 1990 to the financial crisis, there were about 149 banks starting every year. Post the financial crisis, there were four on average starting every year. So the government basically came out and said, we don't really like small banks. So that's a factor. They're the ones that have to approve the de novo banking charters. But what happened after 2008 was not that too big to fail meant we were gonna democratize banking. Too big to fail meant we only wanted a few banks. So here's what happened, because then we could regulate them, right? Then they were SIFI banks, they were strategic. So here's the bank market share, small banks and credit unions in 2006, medium banks and credit unions accounted for 28% or a third of all the banking assets out there. Now look at the bank market share in 2018. They cut the small banks in half and they cut the medium banks, not in half, but by 60%, 40%, I should say. Um, the giant banks took over 59% of the market share, they had 47% then. So this was certainly not a period that was good if you were a small bank. Well, what happens to small business? I think there's probably an analog here. I don't really like it, by the way, because I don't like winner take all economies. But there's gonna be risk aversion in the small business world. I thought about this. Um, this might be my last chart, actually. But this is the personal savings rate, right? This is what percentage of our paychecks as individuals we save um, on an annualized basis. So in 2005, we were saving about $2 for every $100 we made. There was significant risk aversion after the experience we went through in 2008 and 2009. Um, personal savings rate, spiked up to 12%. We were saving $12 out of every $100 we make. And even today, we're saving $8 out of every $100. So we got very, very risk averse. We rebuilt our balance sheets. We said, we don't want to go through that again. The amount of startup activity in the United States of America has actually been declining. So there's a dearth of entrepreneurial activity. It's very hard to start a business, compete with Amazon. I mean, that's just the reality of things. Um, so we already had some trends that were dispiriting relative to small business. I think this does make it more challenging. So does risk aversion to see a proliferation or a big rebound in small business. Going to have to be some policies that address this. Um, pretty curious. Also, and this was a question I got from uh, a friend in Nashville, um, there will be a lot of M&A activity. Big businesses will take out, big businesses with big, you know, balance sheets will take out small businesses with upside down balance sheets. So those huge valuations we were seeing in the private equity space and the venture capital space, those are gone, right? They've, they've, the illiquity drives valuations, you know, to a degree above or below what the liquid markets will provide. And so the valuation small businesses in distress right now is, you know, what a great bargain for a large company with a big balance sheet. So if you've got capital, this is an excellent time to be an acquirer and we'll see a lot of that sort of vulture capital coming back in to pick off some fallen angels. All right, um, Teresa, some of this is for you as well. We got a lot of questions around, I'm a small business owner with no sales right now. What do I do? Well. Teresa, I'll give you an opportunity to weigh in. But just so you know, we are spending time and energy tracking the stimulus to try and figure out how to get it into our clients' hands. Um, 
I'll give you one tip and then I'm going to defer to Teresa on what we're going to do to give you more information. One tip is if you don't have a banker and you're a small business that you're in regular conversation with, you better get one super fast. Um, there are 4,700 banks in the United States of America. There are you know, millions of businesses. There are 75,000 bank branches, I think. Um, you think there's gonna be a rush on the hospitals? Once this stimulus gets passed and there's two trillion available for people, there's gonna be a rush on the banks. So you need to, it's like going to the butcher. You need to pull a number and get in line, even though this bill has a and for the specifics on that, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Teresa, because you have some information on that. Yeah, you, you kind of stole a little bit of my thunder there, David. Um, we that did is. receive a ton of emails and calls this week um, from business owners saying the information is great, but what do we do with it? What, are, what is it that we need to do right now? Obviously, that this hasn't been signed yet. Um, so the two things that, that we can suggest today, number one, as David said, this is definitely not the time to robo. Um, if your business has been great and, and your relationship with your business lender has fallen away, now is the time um, to bring that back. You really want a friend and a face with something like this that, that can guide you. Right now with that person, you're going to be preparing all of the documents for your application. Again, not a lot of clarity this week. We've gained more through the weekend. We'll have even more. We think the fastest dollars that will come through will be in the form of grants for up to $10,000. Those will be based on your credit score, we think. We think that's how that's going to work. That will be the fastest dollars getting into your hand. The other thing that you can do is one o'clock on Monday, our friends with Petra Coach have invited David and I to hop on a call and we will be doing a presentation that demystifies the CARES Act. So we'll spend the rest of today and through the weekend, figuring out what, what you do with all of this. Um, hopefully it will be signed and then the lending can begin. But as David said, get a relationship, start to prepare. There will be a lot of documentation required. Thank you, Teresa. I mean, it's gonna be another long, long weekend of doing hard work to try and get this uh, fog cut for you by Monday, but we'll have a big presentation on it then. The bill is 800 pages, so. Um, it's going to be a long weekend. And David, I'll add that when we send out the replay to this call, uh, we've recorded today's call, I will have information on how to sign up for the call on Monday, again, with our friends at PetroCoach. If you would like to get more updates on going to all of the information that we have coming through um, with the various acts and stimulus, um, please text the word Waddell, W-A-D-D-E-L-L, to 44222. And again, just pull up a text like you would text to a friend and enter that number 44222 like it is the phone number in the text box. And David, back to you. All right, thank you. So that is this week's dynamic edition of our weekly strategic insight. Um, thank you for the feedback and the encouragement after the work that we did last week. We are trying to get on our website, a warehouse of our materials and sort of a COVID file that'll be easy to access. And we're here, obviously, for you. We got a no voicemail policy 24 7. Give us a call, even if it's over the weekend. Um, for those of you who have small businesses, I get it. Hang tight. By Monday, we should have a whole lot of clarity on which way to go. Um, and I'm just really grateful for all of you and hope you're enjoying your self-isolation, but I'm encouraging you to get outside because the flowers are blooming and the birds are chirping. So with that, I'll sign off. You guys have a great weekend and thank you as always for your trust and confidence in what we do at Wild Associates.